out and a great number of people are gathered in to the wedding feast for the king's son. But when the king comes in, he spots among that great company there is a man who is there without a wedding garment. And he is challenged about this. Why have you come in here with no wedding garment? And the man is speechless. He cannot give any explanation. And the king has him thrown out into the outer darkness. And here is a picture of a man who outwardly has responded to the gospel. Because the gospel, in a sense, it is like an invitation, a call, a summons to the marriage of Christ and his church. It is a, a call to come and to be part of this great revelation that God has given of the love of Christ for his people. And so here is someone who outwardly has responded. He has said, yes, I have become a Christian, and yet he isn't really. And when the great day comes and the, the wedding feast actually comes about and the king comes in, he sees that this man is unfit to be there. He is like salt that has no savour. He says he's a Christian, but he has no inner reality. We find the same thing in, later on in this sermon, when Jesus gives a solemn warning towards the end, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He's warning that it's one thing simply to use the language, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, Jesus is my Lord. It's another thing for that to be an inward reality, for someone to be truly obedient to Christ as his Lord and Savior, to have the true character of a Christian believer. The Apostle Paul warns us, that even in the early days of the church there were many who did not have the character of true Christian people. Philippians 3.18 he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, and whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, whose mind is set upon earthly things. Here are people who are in the Christian church. They are professing that they are Christian believers. And yet Paul says the reality is that they have nothing of the character of a Christian. And so again, they are like salt that has no characteristic of being salt. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul speaks about the last days in which perilous times, he says, dangerous times, spiritually dangerous, will come. Men will be lovers of themselves and so on, lovers of pleasure. And one expression he uses is having the form of godliness but denying the power of it. Again, we have the, the, the man, the woman who outwardly is a Christian and yet knows nothing of the transforming power of God in his or her life. And Jesus is telling us that salt that does not have the characteristics of salt is worthless, useless, and will finally be thrown out. And Jesus is reminding us, you see, that we must be Sermon on the Mount Christians. 
that is the only kind of Christian that there really is. To be anything other than a Sermon on the Mount Christian is not to be a Christian at all. Because the character that Jesus is describing here is the character of every citizen of God's kingdom. There is no entry into the kingdom of God for those who do not have the character of God's people. You, he says, are the salt of the earth. But you will only function as salt if you really have this character which I've already described. The second thing he says is, you are the light of the world. Now, like salt, light is essential, necessary to life. We read about light right at the beginning of the Bible. In the first chapter of the first book, Genesis, we read that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 describes the original unformed state of everything. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then the third verse of the Bible, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And we know that light is of tremendous necessity and importance. We know that life on earth depends upon our relationship to the sun and that light and heat are absolutely necessary. As human beings, sight is one of our primary senses. And how different life is for someone who is blind and cannot see. How difficult it is in human society for such a person. What a handicap it is to be a man or a woman living in this world and yet blind, unable to see. Sight is so important for us and sight of course depends entirely upon light. Not only so, but God himself is described as light. In um, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him, from Christ, and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And light, of course, here speaks of absolute moral purity. God dwells, we are told elsewhere, in unapproachable light. It speaks of his holiness, his absolutely undefiled moral character. Moreover, Christ also is described as being light. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we read this in verse 4, In him, that's in Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And Jesus himself says later in the Gospel of John, concerning himself, I am the light of the world. 
Now it's all the more remarkable, therefore, that here in this verse, Jesus says to Christian believers, you are the light of the world. Christian believers who by the grace of God have been made partakers of the divine nature, they share Christ's function to be light in the moral darkness of this world. Now again, that speaks to us of the unflattering view of the world which Jesus held. He clearly saw it as a world of darkness, moral darkness, spiritual darkness. He saw men and women as being blind to spiritual realities, alienated from the life of God. But he is saying to those who believe in him, who is the light of the world, you are the light of this world. And here, of course, we have a rather more positive function than that of salt. This goes beyond merely holding back corruption. This becomes more positive in bringing light and knowledge and truth. And then Jesus gives another warning. In the case of the salt, the warning was about losing your saltiness, losing your character, becoming contaminated, defiled, corrupted, and becoming useless. But in relation to our being the light of the world, Jesus gives a somewhat different warning. Not the warning of losing character, but the warning of concealing it. And he does this by two, two means. First of all, there's the picture of the city. He said, a city built on the top of a hill cannot be hidden. That is obvious, isn't it? Travelers approaching that city will see it from a great distance because it's not down in the valley, it's not hidden, it's not concealed, it is up on a hill and for many miles around people will see the city and it's no good trying to hide it from view and the second illustration he speaks about people lighting a lamp now if you light a lamp you have a purpose you want the place to be well lit and so what you do is you put it up aloft where it will actually give light. Nobody sane lights a lamp and then takes it and carefully puts it in a corner of the room under a bucket. That would defeat the whole point of lighting the lamp in the first place. Light is there to be seen. And Jesus is here reminding us that true Christianity gives light to others and it is impossible ultimately for true Christianity ever to be hidden. We have examples in the Bible of people who tried to conceal their faith. One was Jonah. He was running away from God. He got on board this ship going to Tarshish and he desperately didn't want anybody to know that he was a prophet of the Lord. And we know the terrible things that happened to him. He was found out and ashamed to be found out. The other example in the New Testament is Peter. In the courtyard of the high priest, he was desperately anxious that nobody should know that he was a disciple of Jesus. But he too was found out and deeply ashamed of what he had done. And Jesus is telling us that 